Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as I just said, uh, my name is Rich Fenton. Um, I work for P Pure Storage in the UK as a technical specialist of a member of the FlashBlade team. Uh, FlashBlade is a product that was developed really with um, engineering from the ground up with new generation workloads in mind. So modern analytics, uh, continuous development and integration, and AI deep learning and the challenges that those types of workloads uh, produce. Um, FlashBlade was really designed to, to help with those and hopefully you'll, you'll see some of uh, the aspects of, of that during the presentation today. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of technical detail about our product. What this presentation is about is really about some of the learnings that we found as our customers have deployed AI and deep learning uh, applications um, in conjunction with us. And these range from the very sophisticated customers, um, customers that are well along their journey with developing AI and deep learning frameworks, to a lot of customers that are just starting out and starting to um, develop and see how they can use these technologies. So this presentation is around some of those lessons that we've learned from those customers that have already started on those journeys. And it mainly focuses around production AI and the use of production AI as a use case. So not less so the research AI where customers are starting out trying to build models pr to provide assumptions or do a study or do a graph and move on to the next project. It's to more the customers that are using AI in production workloads. So they're constantly redoing training, constantly running training in, in order to support a business purpose. So the obvious candidates are people like um, the customers who are building self-driving um, cars. The Zenuity Volvo is one of our uh, public examples of, of customers that are, are um, uh, embracing that challenge. Uh, very large social networks, um, customers doing cancer uh, detection, drug discovery, fraud detection, and uh, automated um, trading strategies as well. Uh, and the, what these customers tend to do is they tend to do um, productionized AI where they're constantly doing training and learning and using that as a, a part of a continuous loop. So I guess I'm going to start with a bold claim. And my bold claim is that storage is the most critical part of AI. I see a lot of skeptical faces in the audience. So that's not strictly true. Uh, what is true, however, is data is one of the most uh, critical points of, of AI and one of the most important parts. And the quantity and quality of data and providing that data to the AI, AI algorithms is the most critical part and one of the most um, key attributes. And of course, storage's relationship to data to ensure that the data is stored, but more importantly fed, has a natural association, which is clearly where us as pure storage play as well. So why now? What's the difference? What's happening now which is making AI so front and center of everybody's attention? Of course, there's three key innovations that we're seeing that's making deep learning and AI training as, as, as a reality, uh, rather than the, the false dawns that we've seen over the past 30, 40 years. And those real key um, innovations are around new algorithms, algorithms that are much, much um, more, um, uh, 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 much more uh, useful and uh, accurate when it comes to training. Uh, the newer algorithms are, are much more accurate uh, compared to what we had previously. So the ability to be able to build convolutional neural networks or concurrent networks has been accelerated and the simplicity of being able to do that has been uh, grossly uh, uh, simplified as well, and much more accessible. But also the rise of compute power. So obviously Moore's law is tailing off from a CPU perspective, but now we're seeing the rise of GPUs as being massively parallel clusters that can provide a huge amount of compute power. So having thousands and thousands of cores allow us to do training from months to weeks to days, as opposed to um, what we previously had. And then the final aspect is really what we're focused on is the data aspect. And obviously there is a wealth of data there. Um, the Economist describes data as a new oil um, and the fact that data is fundamental to allowing these algorithms to be able to learn better and to be more accurate with their models. So over the next 30, 40 minutes, that's really what I'm going to focus on, some of the attributes on how our customers have scaled the data aspects of their uh, learning models. So technology innovation has also surrounded these areas of discipline. So obviously we've seen the frameworks that have been responsible, the modern frameworks that have been responsible for building um, deep learning and neural networks. TensorFlow from Google, PyTorch, Cafe and Cafe 2 by Facebook, MXNet by Amazon, and also Horovod by Uber to allow you to do multi-core um, processing across a, 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 a GPU platform. And the frameworks do nothing without having 
compute to be able to run to get answers quickly. So we've seen the rise of NVIDIA bringing to market not only their cards, and um, Tesla-based cards, but running workstations, but also compute platforms that give you a, a massive amount of scalability in the DGX and the DGX2 platforms. Uh, but of course, there's other vendors that are, uh, are participating in the GPU space, but NVIDIA has clearly taken a, a large lead there. And then from a storage perspective, being able to feed those GPUs from a storage perspective and being able to uh, allow them to perform, keeping keep the fed with data, this is really our area of fo focus. And there's a lot of innovation there that's not just around making storage faster and using a faster technology like Flash. It's being able to deliver the data and remove any bottlenecks, uh, both architecturally and operationally from the storage platform as well. So data is absolutely vital to machine learning. Uh, and this is really one of the studies that Professor Ng um, uh, observed, was the fact that tra traditional algorithms really plateau. So you can give a traditional alg algorithm, say, 10,000 data points, and it doesn't matter if you double that number of data points or triple that number of data points, the traditional alg algorithms don't get any more accurate with the more amount of data that you provide to them. And that's not true for the new algorithms, which get more accurate with the more data that you show to them. There was a really good example that Google used. So Google used a, uh, a study where they used ImageNet. Um, for those that are unaware, ImageNet is a public data set that's commonly used. It consists of 1.3 million Im images, and it's used for object recognition tasks. And Google had an experiment where they said, we can do some training with ImageNet, ImageNet and use the 1.3 million images that we have with ImageNet. But actually, if we take the same algorithms, the same process, the same applications, and apply it to their data set, which is Google Image Search, which is around 300 million images, what would be the difference in the, uh, the learning and the accuracy of the models? Um, so no code was changing, no pr process was changing. It was just exposing the same algorithms to a much, much larger data set. And they found that doing so, they got much more significant higher accuracy during, during that whole process. Uh, just by exposing the same algorithms to more data. And generally, we see it's a logarith logarith logarithmic scale. So effectively, you, in order to double your accuracy, you need 10 times the amount of data, which introduces some interesting challenges from an infrastructure perspective, in able to store that data, providing that data, and then also making sure that you have no pinch points in the infrastructure as well. Uh, and this led to Peter Norvig, who's one of the senior uh, engineering directors at Google to say it's not that their algorithms are any better or the algorithms they were using any better, it's just the fact that they have more data that they can analyze and therefore get more accurate models. I think going back to Professor Ng again, he created this really nice analogy that likens the development of AI in shooting for a moon or shooting for a new exploration as a rocket ship in the, in the sense that the algorithms that we use are essentially the engines but what's feeding those engines in order to get into, into our destination is the data that's uh, being, being the fuel for those engines. So you can't just use data in its raw form. Um, effectively, it would be nice if we can just take data and start to use it and apply it to our algorithms, but it's obviously not as simple as that. There's actually a hierarchy of needs, very similar to Laszlo's hierarchy of needs. First, we have to acquire the data from the relevant sources. Um, that might be multiple sources if it was a, uh, uh, you know, a different uh, project. Then, obviously, we can't just use that data. It then needs to be prepared. So it needs to be cleaned. It needs to be transformed. It needs to be put into a usable format. Um, and then, also, we then can apply the machine learning algorithms to it which is really the key focus of uh, data science and, and AI. And then finally, there's a validation process of understanding, have the models skewed? Are they correct? Do they need um, altering or changing? And each of these sits on top of one another. So you can't do preparation until you have the data in the first place. You can't do machine, le machine learning until you have the data in a um, spe specified format. And likewise, you can't do validation until you've got a model that particularly works. So again, but applying a, a correct amount of data to the um, learning algorithms is really, really critical. So the way we like to think about it, this fundamental process is if you have a neural network that may have a certain number of parameters, for example, it might have 100 million weights inside the network, and you only give it 10 pictures, an extreme use case, then the network will only memorize those pictures or it will memorize faculties of those pictures that this is a cat, this is a dog, 
or that the ordering is um, so specific because there's far too many attributes in the pictures as there are variables in, in, in the network. Um, so it's essential that providing more data to that, um, uh, to that network and to that model allows you to be able to be able to normalize and be able to have the model that's truly learning as opposed to just memor memorizing faculties of the data. So obviously the bottom two layers here really focus on um, data, the acquisition of data, cleaning, labeling, and the distortion of data. And that really brings us to the first lesson, is that AI is a data pipeline. Uh, quite often, it's not just a single application of the machine learning or the training process, which is qu quite often what we are myopically focused on as part of uh, the, the AI um, uh, learning process. It's really a series of applications that by adding to the final uh, uh, training neural network, it's a pipeline that builds up over a period of time that takes us from ingestion to um, uh, the, 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 the final analysis and the final um, learning. So why do we focus on the AI part? Why do we focus on the training and the learning part? And it's really because that's where the most interesting, most sophisticated maths and the algorithms are. So it's not, um, it's not surprising that that gets the most att attention. But again, if you look at the wider ecosystem, a lot, there's a lot more to it than the code that does the machine learning. So there's a really interesting paper that Google published a, about 18 months ago that shows the hidden technical debt of machine learning systems. And this black box here in the middle is just the machine learning, learning part of the code. And there's all this surrounding infrastructure and process that go into supporting that, uh, that, that aspect. So, uh, again, there's links to the presentation if you want to um, see these uh, uh, white papers and, and documents. Um, um, I'm sure we'll be making the presentations available afterwards. But the paper basically shows that this is a small fraction of the ecosystem. There's parts of it around configuration, um, the monitoring of the systems, the data collection, the feature extraction, the process management, the actual serving infrastructure that form the whole of the AI system. And it's not just that one small segment that's uh, um, part of the, uh, the, the entire project. So when we look at most pipelines, they generally look like this. It's a fairly common process of what the, um, our customers' pipelines look like. On the far left-hand side, you have some form of ingestion. And of course, this will depend on the type of project it is. It might be ingestion from pictures. Uh, there might be medical images or medical scans. It might be if I'm building a self-driving car, LIDAR and radar and camera um, uh, data and GPS data. We've built our internal AI system that does telemetry on the models and the infrastructure that we build in order to be able to provide um, um, fault analysis and um, help us with uh, diagnosing and engineering um, fault cells. So we send logs and telemetry data as part of the infrastructure that we deploy. So all of that has to be ingested somewhere and stored. And then the next process is a cleaning and transformation process. So we'll label the data, we'll annotate it, we'll do anomaly detection, uh, it's effectively an, ex an extract, transform, and, and load in order to prep it, in order that we can start to do learning on, on this. Quite often, we'll see customers bloat their data at this stage. If I don't have enough data to be able to feed my models, then you can subtly change it. You can apply distortions or tweaks. If, if it's a picture, I could change the resolution. I could add distortions or change the rotational because it's still the same data, but I can uh, effectively manipulate the data to be able to provide more, uh, more data to feed the model, uh, effectively uh, aid learning that way. And then once we've gone through that transformation process, then we might actually provide that to the data scientists to be able to go and explore, to be able to go and run iterative models to see what value can we see, what mo models can we build, um, how can we actually use this data to be able to um, develop our models, and then finally go into the training run, which again is what we typically um, see as being the, ma the major focus. And this introduces some really interesting challenges from an infrastructure perspective, because it basically is a copy process of taking data in, manipulating it, and moving on to the next stage of the pipeline. As in the, my oil analogy earlier, it's kind of bringing it in, moving it along the pipeline, processing it, and moving it out to distribution, and finally get to, a, to an end product. And the challenge that this faces from an infrastructure perspective is that it requires very, very different workloads. And typically, as an infrastructure provider, 
you optimize your platforms to be very good at one thing, very good at sequential data and being able to handle lots of streams of lots of data. Or when I'm doing an analysis, I might be very, very quick and low latency at doing lots and lots of streams of very, very small uh, um, block sizes, which are very, very typically competing different products. And as we can see from the stages of this pipeline, it tends to be varied and it tends to wide between the, the, uh, the, the, the extremes from an infrastructure perspective. So think about ingestion. Typically, you'll be getting lots and lots of data points all streaming at the same time. So lots and lots of sources means lots and lots of concurrency. Very, very write driven, very, very sequential driven. Then when I go into the cleaning and transformation uh, phase, I'm probably doing that sequentially. It could be randomly. It's going to be a mixture of reads or writes. It could be small files or large files. But again, it's going to be concurrency high level of concurrency, because the quicker I can do that operation, then the quicker I can move on to the next stage of the pipeline, which is allow somebody to start exploring the data set. And then finally, when I go into the training um, uh, run, that's going to be very, very random, very, very read intensive, and extremely high level of concurrency. The more compute I have, the more concurrency I can get. And again, that's a very, very challenging workload from an infrastructure perspective. So. When we actually look at what a lot of customers do is they throw their data into a data lake. And actually, that's our second lesson learned for today, is don't throw your data into a data lake. And what we've been taught over the last five, 10 years is not to throw any data away. Collate it and curate it and store it somewhere, because we know there's value in there, but we haven't worked out exactly how do we extract that value. So the natural inclination is to store them somewhere cheap and deep. And that's really created the rise of data lakes. However, it doesn't really work for AI and modern analytics workloads. Because when you look at a data lake, it often falls short. And we're seeing in the industry, the data lake is great for curation, but it's not very good for supporting a pipeline that we just saw previously. So, and that's really because of um, challenges with the infrastructure that we typically deploy these mass file systems on. It might be a cheap and deep storage system, or it might be something like a Hadoop file system or a HDFS-based file system where it's cheap and deep to be able to store and go and be able to curate that data over a period of time. So it starts to end up like a data graveyard. And this really represents two real key challenges. Uh, the first challenge is trusting the data. I've got all this massive amount of space and um, data that's just been put there as a, as a repository. I've got to understand, can I trust the data? Why is it there? Where did it come from? Is it still valid? Has it been cleaned? Has it been verified? It's a very difficult thing to annotate its use cases when somebody's just stored it there as a, a convenient place to store. And then the other aspect is more of a technical challenge, is that I've got this data in a file system. How do I make all the application and all the eight stages of the pipeline, how do I make it usable when it has these very, very different competing requirements? And the challenge that Hadoop typically has is it was really built with a different era in mind. It was based on the Google file system. And the Google file system made certain assumptions. It made assumptions like we use slow spinning disks. We use a relatively slow network. A one gigabit network was effectively the, the best you could get when um, Google file system and HDFS was first deployed. And it should be deployed on commodity hardware. Commodity hardware, as we know, fails, so we replicate it multiple times to, to, to be able to serve for those failures. And the types of workload that it would be suited for would be very sequential driven, very batch driven, and driven for large files and large data sets, because that's what MapReduce was fundamentally um, um, uh, written for. And as we saw earlier, the challenge this produces is when you look at those different stages of the pipeline, it doesn't really fit this world. Some of it's random, some of it's sequential, some of it's large files. It could be lots of small files, but actually there's more than likely going to be a lot of concurrency. So this may be good to store data, but it's not very good to go and process it and access it in a multi-stage way in a multi multiple pipeline. So the other challenge this faces is as part of that pipeline, you'll probably use lots and lots of different tools in order to do the ingestion in order to do the transformation of the data, the cleaning of the data, and then obviously the different frameworks to go and do deep learning on. And 10 years ago, we just had to do it, really, as MapReduce. And as what we see today, we have a whole bunch of utilities and tools that whole, all have different capabilities and different requirements, and are often built out as being um, silos of infrastructure. 
So I have a Kafka cluster, I'll have a Spark cluster, I've also got my large data lake, and then I'll have a, uh, uh, an, an area that I do trading. So these are all discrete hardware, which is, uh, isn't particularly shared and isn't particularly um, um, the great utilization um, that, we, uh, that we could um, uh, drive towards. So it's kind of like, you should expect this to change as well. So our customers that have built pipelines in this way have started with a pipeline in mind, used a subset of these tools, and then they'll get them to a certain point. So they might start using syslog or rsyslog, and then they'll take that out and replace it with logstash. They might use a different me messaging framework and move to Kafka. So the ability to change your pipeline and to substitute tools appropriately means that you need to have flexibility in order to be able to make those changes. Because what you have today is probably not what you're going to have 12 months or 18 months over time, because you're probably going to naturally um, evolve this pipeline. And that becomes really, really difficult with a data lake. Because my data lake is a central repository where I'm storing all my data. And then each different stage of the pipeline might be using different tools with different sets of infrastructure. So clearly, I have a problem of being able to have bespoke infrastructure that's dedicated for each part of those pipelines. But then I've also got to start to move the data to get it to the right place and the right time. And it's very, very difficult to decouple the compute and the application platform from the data and the underlying um, storage that's serving, the, um, serving that data. Effectively, the two become um, locked, and, uh, 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 locked and, and fused together. And this is applicable because I've got to be able to have the performance and the different performance uh, requirements for each stages of those applications and each stages of those pipelines. So often we get asked is, should I go to the cloud or should I not use the cloud? Should I be doing this on premises? And the answer is it really, it depends. And it depends where you are on your AI journey and also your jurisdiction. Sometimes you won't be allowed to put data into the cloud but you still want to have cloud-like capabilities to be able to deploy quickly and be able to expand and manage seamlessly. So what we often see is during the exploration phase, then the cloud is a fantastic place to start because it allows me to learn the algorithms, it allows me to get started without, with minimal investment, and it allows me to start and learn quickly, fail quickly, and also get a certain level of succession, uh, su uh, succeeding in, in, in regards to their value within the model. What we typically see, though, is as you start to move to the production phase, then cloud becomes to, um, to, to be challenging um, from a cost perspective. So you think about cloud, it provides the elast elasticity. So if I need um, more extra compute, more extra performance at a specific point of time in the year because of seasonality, then cloud allows me to have that elast elasticity. But if you're doing production AI training, then the chances are is that you're going to be running GPUs 24 hours a day. That should be your goal is to keep those GPUs busy, and more importantly, keep your data scientists busy. And then one of the hidden costs with this process is the storage costs, because not only do you have to store the data in the cloud provider, but each I.O. that you do, each time you access that data, which can be trillions of times when you're doing learning, also incurs storage costs and, and costs from a, a cloud perspective. So it can very, very quickly become very expensive to house data in the cloud. Um, or, or house um, AI and deep learning in the cloud. And of course, as cost and availability and resource availability becomes difficult, then that starts to get in the way of me doing production AI and scaling production AI, because very quickly it might be better to do that um, on, on premises. So then, again, a very simple analogy I use is, I'm staying in a hotel, I don't live in London, I'm here for the next three days, so I'm in a hotel that's just across the road. It's really nice. It's comforting, there's a TV, a nice shower, a, a nice bar as well. I can eat there in, in the restaurant at night. But it's going to be very, very um, convenient for me just to stay there for the next three days. But if I had to stay in London for six months, 12 months, a couple of years, three or four years, then that's not going to scale from a commerce perspective. So I'm going to be much uh, better to buy somewhere, much more cost effective, maybe not in central London, or certainly to rent and consume in the same, same model. And we often see that when we look at cost efficiencies, deploying on premises for the similar types of GPUs, the similar types of storage systems, often they can pay for themselves and get a return on investment for a dedicated infrastructure uh, over a much more short, shorter period of time based off a um, cloud technology. 
But again, it's going to be what's the right point of time for you in your use case and where you are along with that journey. And we see some customers that are going a hybrid cloud approach um, to moving data to the cloud and then moving it back and doing processing. In fact, that's something that we do internally with some of our pipelines as well. The key thing to note is as you start to production AI, then you're just going to start to use those resources more and more effectively. And again, the goal is to run them 24 by 7, especially if you're doing some um, business uh, or production um, uh, analytics with, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the application. So make sure that you don't do anything that's going to take you down a rat hole and cause you to, uh, to, be, um, uh, uh, to be locked in, whether that's on-premise or whether it's, um, um, uh, whether it's within the cloud. So our fourth lesson is be very wary of benchmarks. And benchmarks in the infrastructure industry is something that vendors really, really love. And it's a way of them to be able to have a vanity of if I can provide a higher benchmark or a faster benchmark, then in some ways I, I'm, I'm better and you should buy my product. That's traditionally the way infrastructures, uh, infrastructure providers have, have sold or, or positioned their technologies. And they can be really, really misleading as part of um, uh, that whole entire process. So traditionally, again, using it as a vanity point to score products, uh, to score um, uh, products and, and capability is not a really uh, great way of, of, of doing this. And that's because everybody's workloads are different. So there are a lot of uh, artificial intelligence, um, deep learning frameworks and um, uh, reference architectures that are out there today that are using ImageNet, what we saw before, and the process and the capability of being able to process a number of images using ImageNet as being a, a capability of their effectiveness within the, uh, uh, within the benchmark community. And if you actually look at it, ImageNet is, average file size of ImageNet is 100 to 200 kilobytes in size, not particularly high res. The files are packed into TF records, so multiple files and multiple images are packed into 150 meg um, sort of frames, if you like. And the mode of testing is very synthetic. It's very uh, unreal world-like. And if you compare that to a real-world project, something like a, a customer that's building a self-driving car, Image sizes tend to be much bigger. They shoot at full resolution because all of those pixels have valuable information in them. Anybody that shoots uh, an SLR camera will probably shoot in RAW and understand that. Um, they don't pack them in any way, shape, or form because packing gets in the process of being able to um, query and be able to learn from, from that data and unpacking that data. So it tends to be lots and lots of files or frames. Um, and again, because the data size is so large, they don't sit into cache, and they don't sit into the memory of the, um, the GPUs, so therefore they have to be read from an external um, storage device or some sort of storage device. And again, typically a benchmark will focus on one element of the training. Going back to the Google paper earlier, if you look at benchmarks, they're only looking at the training aspect and not looking at that pipeline in total. So the process of moving that data between ingestion, to between... Um, uh, cleaning and uh, transformation of the data, then onto exploration, then onto training, takes time. So, for instance, on a DGX platform, in order to be able to read in eight terabytes of data, that's going to take close to two hours of time, two to three hours of time, before you can start to learn. And that effectively means that you've got a bottleneck further up your pipeline. So by having the data ready in situ, you can point your GPUs at it, that it, it eradicates that time, and, and no benchmark is going to show that, um, that time to compute. Now, now, actually, as it stands, we were one of the first vendors that published a reference ar architecture. We call this ARI. It stands for AI Ready Infrastructure. And this is a collaboration between ourselves, Pure Storage, um, NVIDIA as a GPU platform, uh, and Cisco and Arista as a network platform to provide a reference infrastructure that you can very, very quickly readily deploy. So known quantities, you can deploy it very rapidly and stand up a on-premises based cloud um, that you can start to readily use for, uh, for deep learning training and not just have the hardware components, but also to have the software components to make this um, um, deployable. And we refer to this as the Airy Scaling Toolkit. And actually, this was uh, the Airy Scaling Toolkit was something that we demonstrated using benchmarks. So we 
I said, be wary of benchmarks, but I'll explain why we use benchmarks to do this. And I think this been, has been a little bit misconstrued uh, uh, more recently. So ARI is effectively a segregation between the compute and the storage platform. So you don't have to deploy it in a certain way or a certain shape or form. We market it in a certain way or a certain shape or form. We have the ARI Mini, which are two DGXs to half a populated flash blade. And then we have the full-blown area, which are four DGXs and a, a, a fully populated flash blade. But actually, this is not what our customers deploy. So for instance, Senuity, they have eight DGXs to one flash blade. Um, Page AI, who are doing cancer research, they're on, I think they're on nine DGXs to one flash blade. And the beauty of this architecture is, A, it's very easy to deploy. All the hard work of engineering, what plugs into what, how you stand one of these up quickly has already been done. It's a, a reference infrastructure. But also, if you need more compute because you need your models to run quickly, then it should be easy to add further DGXs and get more further compute power. Likewise, if you need further storage because you're storing more data as part of your models because that's fundamentally the fuel to your rocket engines, then you should be able to scale the storage independently and not have the storage or the network be the bottleneck as part of this process. So as part of launching Gary, we also showed these benchmarks. And these benchmarks were really focused on ResNet 50, Inception 3, VGG, VGG 16, as three different frameworks that we wanted to see how they scale. How does a customer get the most out of a single DGX, really rinse the, the, uh, uh, the towel to be able to get every drop of performance uh, to its maximum? And then how do they scale that workload to go from two to three to four DGXs and see, hopefully, a linear experience as they do that? Because that's fundamentally what we're trying to provide. So we weren't doing this to say, oh, look how great we are. We can, do, we can process 10,000 images per second. That's so much better than our competitors. We're using these benchmarks in order to say, are what we're doing, is what we're doing, is it good? And how can it be improved? And fundamentally, how can it be scaled out beyond multiple nodes? So our methodology to do this was to use ImageNet. What we saw before, 1.3 million images, 1,000 categories. And we used those three frameworks because we didn't want to solely focus on one framework as, a, um, as part of that sca scaling model. And we basically went through a whole series of testing in conjunction with NVIDIA and our, um, Cisco and Arista as our network partners to be able to see how do we tune and how do we parameterize in order to do multi-node scaling as part of this um, whole process. So the software stack that we used is um, effectively TensorFlow in order to run our uh, uh, image uh, uh, recognition. We use the CUDA framework, which is um, effectively an NVIDIA deep learning library SDK that allows GPU accelerated um, uh, primitives. Um, and then um, we also used um, Horovod, uh, and also, which is effectively developed by Uber, and also in, in order to do multi-node training across uh, multiple um, GPUs. And the process we followed in order to use the benchmarks to do this was basically to set things up in accordance to our best practices, plug everything in together, and then basically go and run training. Default settings, don't change anything out of the box. And we got 216 images per second for a standard training run. These are the numbers specifically for um, Inception 3 with a batch size of 64. And we saw that we got 216 images per second, which we thought was good, but we had nothing to compare it against. We didn't know if that was good, bad, or indifferent. So what we did is we then ran a synthetic test. So rather than reading images from the storage platform, we best basically fed the GPUs white noise. And that white noise effectively took storage I.O. out of the picture. So there was no storage interaction. It was effectively processing white noise, white noise data that was in the GPUs. We're not going to get any decent model out of this. There's nothing to look for. There's nothing to categorize. But it effectively gave us the performance that, theoretically, this is what the GPUs can run at. And we could see that that was 228 images per second. That's the maximum you'd probably get out of a single GPU um, system. And that wasn't good enough, because if we scale that across multiple GPUs, then that's going to be a fairly significant difference. So we did some tweaking. Um, we actually found that if we enabled a prefetch cache within the GPUs, then it allows us to be able to change the scheduling behavior in order to keep those GPUs fed and watered rather than waiting for storage and waiting for their images. 
So by adding that prefetch cache, we were pushing 225 images per second, which the theoretic maximum using white data was 228 images per second. So we're pretty happy that with that as a, uh, as a, uh, as a, a, a scalable platform, we were, we're pushing a single GPU as fast as we could. So if we scale that across four nodes, then theoretically, we should be able to get close to, you know, um, let's say on the graph there, 7,200 images. So taking what we can do in a single box, applying it across four GP, uh, sorry, 32 GPUs, which are four DGXs, we should be able to get somewhere close to 7,200 7, 200, 200 images. But it's not as simple as that because now all of those nodes have to intercommunicate and have to share data and be able to um, um, effectively train as a single entity. And that adds an overhead. So actually when we ran this with our defaults, we were way off that linear sc scalability, a 42% gap. We were around just over 4,100 uh, images per second. So again, we went through the same process of doing multi-node scaling and adding a um, a prefetch cache to that process, and that gave us a nice bump in the speed. And then we also did some tuning of the threads and tuning of the variables um, in order to be able to make the um, multi-node um, uh, scaling um, uh, much more tuned. Again, this is a brute force process that we used in order to tweak the variables in order to see did we get a benefit or a detriment as part of that. And we got pretty close to 5,527 images, so still not quite at the uh, synthetic maximum, but fairly close to it. The final step that we did was we tried to identify where the bottleneck was, and we actually found that the bottleneck was applying distortions to the image data. Um, so removing that step, which isn't something that you do in a production workload, actually got us very, very close to the synthetic maximums that we could achieve. So although we have actually haven't... Um, uh, we wouldn't recommend this in a production workload. We now know that that's where our focus is going to be um, in order to be able to improve this pipeline to get fairly near li linearity. So the whole process of this is to use benchmarkings in order to be able to prove that we can scale our workloads be better and apply that knowledge so that people can take that learning and use the AI sc scaling toolkit, the AI scaling toolkit, to be able to, uh, to, be able to accomplish a, um, similar um, types of scalability as opposed to a, a vanity ben benchmark. So finally, the final learning is the ideal platform for this is a data hub. If you remember my picture from early on in the presentation, the concept of having each of these stages of the pipeline being housed on separate infrastructure is wasteful. It's wasteful because you end up with silos that have to be managed independently. Uh, they might be um, silos that are optimized for those specific workloads. And then you have to start to move and transform and copy that data between silos, which inherently gets in the way of the processing of the training. So if I have a bottleneck here, then I can't expect to be able to run those at maximum utilization, because that's fundamentally our goal. The GPUs tend to be relatively expensive. So to have them running at 100% is, 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 is as close to as optimal as we can possibly get. But actually, the most expensive thing in all of this is the data scientists, and they're waiting on the results of the GPUs. So by speeding this whole process up and making sure there's no bottlenecks as part of that training means that our, uh, our data scientists are, 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 production, uh, are, are productive as they possibly can be. So what Flashblade does is effectively collapses all those types of infrastructure to a single architecture. And that's not a difficult trick to pull. Uh, so, sorry, that is an incredibly difficult trick to pull. And that's because not only does this have to be scalable, but it has to be everything to all of those workloads. It has to be able to do random performance. It has to be able to do sequential performance. Concurrency. It has to be able to take lots of concurrent streams as those CPUs are going through training or as your CPU cluster is going through transformation of the data, it has to be able to handle those concurrent um, um, streams. And that's exactly what Flashblade has been architected to do. It's been able to um, um, present a shared piece of storage that can be util utilized and accessed by all of these pipelines, whether it's an AI pipeline in this instance, or whether it's multiple applications um, within a data center. It's not uh, obviously specifically just focused to, to the AI platform. But also, we have to be cloud-like. So deploying infrastructure is harder than deploying cloud infrastructure. So we have to make sure that 
it's as simple as it possibly can be. So in order to scale, in order to orchestrate, in order to be able to um, tune the storage and provision the storage and make it work for all of those use cases, you kind of want to just set and forget and not be an infrastructure expert because there's a lot more interesting things that probably require your attention rather than managing your infrastructure. And we also integrate this with Kubernetes. I saw the presentation prior to, to mine was uh, around Kubernetes and, and uh, administration of Kubernetes. So again, integrating so that you can provision quickly, you can monitor this, you can schedule resources and resource allocation, tear down when you're finished, but also not have to tune and babysit the storage because this is a shared asset. You can't, effect, um, you can't effectively or materially affect each, each of those aspects of those uh, pipelines is, is fundamentally um, what we built with FlashBlade. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, as I said, about FlashBlade. But just from a very high level, the reason we can do this is, A, it's a flash-based architecture. So there's no spinning disk as part of that process. But the real heart of the secret source of what we do comes to down to the way that we distribute data and we provide huge amounts of concurrency. So it, it breaks some of the typical things, that you, the typical challenges that you have with a traditional scale-out file system like a data like, like HDFS or like some of the scientific file systems that are out there. And also, it's incredibly easy to consume. So being able to add, scale, manage, you child could, do, uh, could provision volumes from, from this control. You certainly don't have to uh, be a storage expert in order to be able to um, provide this. And of course, it has to be shareable, because each access or each application as part of that pipeline um, needs to be able to um, um, provision or communicate with the storage array. So we share out over NFS for POSIX compliance applications, and also for a S3 um, compliant uh, um, store from a, an object um, store perspective as well. So again, I'm not going to go into any detail about the secret mechanisms under, underneath that. If you want to know more details of this, please come and see us on the stand. You'll also get a free pair of socks as well. So those are my five lessons learned. Um, the pipeline is not just focusing on the training part much, much bigger than just the training and the uh, machine learning code, which is clearly the, the real interest in the sophisticated part, but don't just focus on that microcosm. There's a, there's a lot more to a, a pipeline. Data lakes, they're great for curation, but fail drastically when you try to start to use them for multiple applications, especially multiple stages of a pipeline due to their inherent um, uh, capability to be able to um, handle all of those performance workloads. Cloud. It's usually a consumption model, being able to start quickly and to be able to get away from the slow IT team that take weeks and weeks to provision. Again, a lot of the on-premises capability day with Kubernetes, with the way that modern architectures are being used to deploy, take you away from that and allow you to have a cloud-like um, model on-premises. And that's not only from a technical perspective, but also from com a commercial perspective as well. Benchmarks. Understand what they're trying to achieve and what they're trying to compare against. Often it's like comparing apples with pears with oranges. But where they're used, understand why they're being used and why we're using benchmarks to, to prove the points. And then finally, a data hub is fundamental to building a highly scalable and fle flexible pipeline and effectively allows you to disaggregate your compute layer from your storage layer, which ultimately gives you flexibility. Uh, because rest assured, is whatever you develop today as part of your pipeline, it's probably going to change and evolve over the coming 12, 24, 36 months. That's certainly what we've seen from our customers. So with that, I thank you very much. Please, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask them now. I'll be around all day. Uh, also, we'll be down on the stand, and any of the guys with the Pure shirts on will be able to answer any questions as well. So with that, thank you very much. <laughs>